us this evening to um, discuss um, uh, the exhibition that he organized um, uh, at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, The Art of Participation. And I'm going to read uh, Rudolph's bio um, and then let him uh, do his thing. Uh, Rudolph studied humanities at the Free University of Berlin and received a PhD from the University of uh, since 88, since 1988, he has curated, lectured, and published internationally on art and media from 1994 through 2006. He was a curator and researcher at the Center for Art and Media, ZKM, in Karlsruhe, Germany. He has taught uh, at the University of Art Berlin, Hochschule für Gestaltung und Kunst Zurich, MiCAD Academy in Barcelona, and he was a visiting professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Mainz. Since 2006, Rudolph has been the curator of media arts at SF MoMA in San Francisco, where he has curated exhibitions with Sylvie Blocher, Anthony McCall, Douglas Gordon, and most recently, two survey shows in, in collaboration and The Art of Participation, 1950 to Now, um, which we will discuss this evening. He is also an adjunct professor at the California College of Arts uh, and the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to have Rudolph um, uh, here tonight uh, in the Masters of Public Art Studies graduate program. He's really the first um, I think institutional curator that we have at least this this uh, this year, um, which I think is a very important um, uh, presence uh, in terms of this ongoing series of talks and discussions we've been having for the past few months with artists, practitioners, organizers, um, because I think he will lend a very very distinct perspective on what it means to organize, particularly this kind of exhibition that deals with participation, both historically, theoretically, and, and more pragmatically. So, um, Rudolph, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joshua. Um, I want to say two things up front. As you realize from his introduction, I'm not a native speaker. So, please, uh, after my lecture, when you want to ask questions, please speak loudly and clearly. I'm also a bit hard of hearing, so I can actually answer your questions. Um, I've been at SF MoMA now for two and a half years, and I was, um, you know, coming from Germany, you don't quite know how this works in the US, you know, in an institution. So it's kind of finding this out as you go along, and, um, I obviously had a few things in mind that I wanted to do. One of them was actually this show um, that was not so clear in my mind when I came, but uh, became more clearer specifically in the fall of 2006 because I realized that Facebook was becoming so prominent here uh, in the US. And I kind of discovered that for myself and I realized this is actually important. Important in its relevance to not only the way that we all network, but also important in the way that our society constitutes itself or reconstitutes itself continuously. And um, so I was able to, to sort of bring this into the museum as an idea, basically saying, you know, we, we need to think about these things. Um, and initially, I even had a working title that made it super clear to everybody, which was called My Museum. And it helped to sort of get the idea across that this is really about looking at the museum again in the year 2006, 7, and 8. And um, we eventually abandoned that title for a number of reasons, but um, it, really, it really generated so much enthusiasm that I was totally struck by that. And I'm still trying to understand what happened. Um, and it's actually really a pleasure to be here tonight. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, this is my first time to sort of look back at what happened and to review this. 
uh, and I spend the last days before coming here literally going through all these documents that we have now, and um, uh, I'll, I'm afraid you'll suffer being the first for, <laughs> for this. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of pictures, I guess. But um, also, I hope that I'll kind of be able to, with you, to sort of distill some of the really important parts of that um, in terms of also its relevance for, um, for the future. And I will, so I will basically go through, um, who has seen the show actually? Okay, very good. So you can actually add, um, please feel free to comment whenever, you know, I'm talking about something. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, give you a brief overview of what the show actually was, since, you know, I see, you know, some of you have a catalog. The catalog obviously does not reflect the way the show was installed and uh, some of the things that happened in the show. Uh, and then I'll focus on some key projects a little bit more in depth uh, since they were really significant um, to this whole um, enterprise. Um, but let me, you know, maybe we can you know, turn down the lights a little bit and <coughs> So I, I, I've been complaining to Joshua earlier that this was really very quick and um, usually you work on shows a lot longer. Minimum is three years. Uh, so this was in the making for less than two years, a year and a half. But this is not working at all now. Let's try again. We should go to the... Uh, yeah, go... Maybe you click on, yeah, the... Um, it's coming. It's coming, okay. Yeah, it's just a lot of pictures, yeah. that's all. <clears throat> and, um, and some of the things that cannot really be explained, but that you just sort of sense is um, that sometimes you just happen to come across an idea at the right moment. And, um, and also I mentioned uh, earlier that the same show would not be possible in the current economic climate. So <clears throat> it is, it's maybe a, a sort of a quality if you have worked in institutions that you sort of sense that now is the time to push for something. Um, because basically our director was telling us, you know, we've been balancing the budget for a number of years now, so we can go forward. And um, I think it was reopening. Okay. It's coming. Okay. All right. So um, I was. Anyway, I was very pleased that this um, this met so much enthusiasm, and I um, when I opened the show and we had you know our dinner and you give this kind of social talk to everybody, this was actually the the project that I finished my talk with, and I want to start with this because this uh, chronologically for me was one of the earlier projects I ever come across. Um, and which really made me think about a, a variety of issues. One is that probably you've never heard of the artist, neither of that project, and why should you? It's, it's been a singular event in Sardinia, in Italy, in the, in the early 80s, 1981, and I only, and I've traveled a lot to Italy, I only happened by chance to come across this project while traveling in Sardinia. And um, and then secondly, this is all you'll find about this project online. And we think of the internet as a space where we basically 
get all information from. Everything we feel is online, but actually it's not. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, you, you, you know, the images are bad, but um, basically what you see are two old women uh, in the traditional black dress um, that women wear once their husbands are dead. And then that's it for the last 20 years. Um, <clears throat> Maria Lai is a, is a local artist, a, a very renowned local artist, who had never done any participatory work at all. She's a sculptor. And she was asked to do a sculpture for the village, uh, basically her hometown, for the local piazza. They were probably imagining to commission a traditional sculpture for the fountain or something like that. And um, instead, what she proposed was that um, she would do a project with all the people, all the villagers. And it would be called Legarsi alla Montagna, which means to tie yourself to the mountain. And uh, so the concept you see up there is a village that is tied by a blue ribbon physically to this, you know, uh, tremendous uh, mountain. And, and the, the village is actually perched onto the uh, slope of that mountain. Okay, that was just an idea. And then, whoever has traveled in a sort of traditional society, in, certainly in the Mediterranean, uh, you will know that um, social relationships in a village are among the most difficult things you can imagine. They are so tight and they are so interwoven with, I wouldn't say centuries, but decades of conflicts. And you will not find, I'm exaggerating a little bit just for the purpose of the argument, but you will not find a single family where there's not an incident that a brother and a sister do not speak to each other anymore or have not spoken for 20 years. Um, so relationships among neighbors, that's maybe a more global issue, are traditionally difficult. And you can have a very easy relationship with someone who's far away, but your next door neighbor might be really among, um, you know, with whom you've had issues in the past. And so that's the same in this village, and her idea was basically to ask every single inhabitant of this village to, to ask a neighbor to tie a ribbon across the street to that window, or that door, or that uh, uh, building in some way. So basically to document a social network physically with tying a ribbon. So people would see that you are related. And as, it, as you can imagine, that turned out to be almost impossible because people say, well, why should I? To them, oh, I couldn't care less. So the work actually existed, um, consisted in, in convincing everybody that they should do this. And in the end, obviously, you know, you, you, you don't succeed 100%. So there were people who still in the end refused, but then finally she was able to really convince the large majority of this village to participate in this. So that in the end it actually became this wonderful network, uh, a maze of blue ribbons uh, for a certain period of time in that village. And eventually then the whole village was tied with this long ribbon to the mountain in a kind of symbolic act that this is where we belong, and uh, but this is also where we're tied to something. We cannot get away from that. And um, I was really struck by something that you know that we keep thinking about in our current work that had happened in a village just completely outside the context of contemporary art, and never got any recognition really. Um, and I would have liked to give it more recognition, but then again, there are no documents about that. All, you know, that is what you see uh, in terms of visual records of that. And I actually went to a small museum uh, that they have installed in 
in memory, not in memory, in um, honoring her local artist. Um, and even there, it was basically uh, impossible to find good representations and good uh, documents about this project. So this brings me to a second and much more related project here to Los Angeles, um, which I have been aware of for, for many years. You know, being a media arts curator and also having worked on a series of projects that kind of review the history of media art, this was a seminal project that really uh, marked an important shift from um, sort of a video-based understanding of media arts to a communication-based uh, understanding of media art. And it involved um, a project in public space, um, I think Century City Mall um, on the left and um, Lincoln uh, Center on the right in New York. And um, all you were able to see were a few excerpts as videos and a few shots in, in publications. But the peculiarity of media and media art is that, um, you know, if you look at, even at this catalog or a number of catalogs, you have a still image or you have a number of images that do not actually necessarily make you understand what a project is. Anything that is process-based and that is time-based is so hard to represent in, you know, in a fixed format um, that this becomes really a problem and, um, and by extension this is even a problem for me working as a curator in our institution. Coming to that institution from the outside and having worked there only for two and a half years I know from my own physical and personal experience, I know only half of our collection. And I, I can go to a database, and I can go to catalogs, and I can read about it, but I've never actually experienced the work. So sometimes it's even hard for me to just go to the archive or to the depot and pull something out. I can't, because it's a complex installation. So one way of um, of reacting to that and sort of uh, circumventing that problem is by actually exhibiting it, which in a way is also a preservation strategy. That you, know, you need to exhibit something again and again under, uh, under different circumstances, different spatial conditions, different technological conditions. So, in a way, I wanted to see this again live. And um, this was one of the key pieces for the whole show. And uh, one of my first trips in preparation of this show actually was here to Los Angeles to meet uh, Kit Galloway and Cher Rabinowitz, um, who have been quite um, critical about institutions in general. And who, and it took me a whole day to actually convince them that this would be the core thing, that this would be a great show, and that they should be part of this. That finally, they should become part of a narrative that is actually based not only in media art histories or media uh, uh, related theories, but that is actually part of an art context. And, um, and that was, in general, symptomatic for me for a lot of the things that I encounter as a curator, but specifically also in institutions. We have parallel narratives. We have a narrative of, let's say, conceptual art, a narrative of contemporary art, um, a narrative of media art, and maybe even a narrative of art in public space, and so on. So these typically do not meet certainly not in the show. And um, bringing these various discourses into one context was an, one of the key moments for me to conceptualize this job. And um, that's why then, in the end, it also made the cover of the book. Um, because clearly, this was about uh, you know people meeting people. 
So you could you know, it made it made a great image if you wish, and it actually um, kind of visualized this idea that in the end this is not about the relation to an object uh, or to a finite form anymore, but this is about the process. And um, so one of one of the first questions that I encountered when the show was up, specifically by journalists, was so so what is the art of participation? To which I actually did not have an answer. And um, I mean, not only as a rhetorical uh, way out, um, I said, actually, this is what we have to find out. Um, one of the things that I know is that um, nobody has ever actually looked at that history. Um, certain shows have had a number of works, maybe, that were participatory. But one of the things that a museum of modern art can do is it can actually go back in time much more convincingly than maybe others and, and tell a history, or maybe tell histories, various narratives that come out of other areas that are not maybe not necessarily media-based, that are not only conceptual. Um, and in our case specifically, um, I'll show you a little bit later, we were specifically able to tell that story because of our collection. And, um, and then I also said, um, the, the art of participation means also it's, it's about art, and it's not about, let's say, uh, processes of democracy or uh, social agendas, it's actually about art. And uh, 1950 to now means 1950 is, is John Cage. And we want to, however, reach the age of Facebook. We want to be contemporary as well. And we want to understand how these ideas that in the beginning seemed very much um, coming out of the legacy of the avant-garde, uh, how these things actually have become mainstream. And what that means in terms of the art that's being produced. So, um, you know, again, that is a quite institutional uh, setting. You, you collaborate with a number of colleagues and the whole educational department is telling you, you know, we've got to mediate this. We've got to structure this clearly and we've got to give wall labels and wall texts and so on which is something I tried to avoid as much as I could uh, because I didn't want to uh, prescribe a certain reading of this show and I also wanted to give various, um, various pathways for the show. And I keep hearing that this is quite demanding for a large public at a place like SFMOMA. And we've got lots of tourists as well who do not come for the art of participation. They just come anyway, and then they just happen to see this show. But um, still, I thought it was very important that we, um, we give a sense of a structure, but we keep it open. So um, I'll just take you through a number of, um, of sections that were sort of defined, but loosely defined, I'd say. And, um, and obviously, um, saying cage, and also uh, going back in time, you know, you cannot, you have to go back also to Umberto Eco, and the notion of the open work of art from his book in 1962, and, um, and this idea that the process of perception in art is is an open process in any case. Um, it only becomes so much clearer through the, the history of, uh, of art, of, of modernism, but also then he was specifically referring to music uh, and people like Cage. 
where um, you do not have this idea of a finished product anymore, but much more a, um, a, an open process that is being staged. It, however, for Umberto Eco, that meant it only clarifies what in any case is a very uh, open relation between you and an artwork and your perception of that. So, having said that, for us it was important to kind of to only start there, but then to actually look at, at projects that would specifically address that problem, that would not so implicitly also refer to that, but actually specifically address it. And, um, and we started with George Brecht, Cage, Hans Hake, Capro, Pike, Rauschenberg, Michael Schomi, Orphos Dell, and Andy Warhol. And I'll give you not all these examples, but some. And, um, and here is an opening shot of what you could say was the beginning, <coughs> although, as a matter of fact, the show had, had a presence in, on, on various floors in the museum, and if you simply just walked up the stairs, you had come across a number of projects already before you even entered the show. So it was kind of a loose opening, and however, that is, <coughs> um, that was where we had our wall text, and that was where we had this work by Hans Hake in the center, um, and I'll come uh, to Hake a, li a little bit later. On the right um, from Hake, you see uh, Alan Capro, a piece from 69 called Hello. And then you, know, you sort of look into uh, our temporary galleries. Here, by the way, you see a shot that was considerably later. This was very much at the beginning. Uh, I think that was pretty much the opening day and if you um, sort of a, this is just a you know, side note, the show was actually postponed for half a year, which made me kind of angry in the beginning, uh, because I wanted to do this very quickly. It had to be a timely project. But then I realized it opened up two great possibilities. One was to actually do a show, a prologue, for that show, which I then called in collaboration, which was basically a, co a collection-based show. So I said, listen, when we postpone the show, so what are we doing instead? You know, the space is empty. Let me at least then do a collection-based show, which was great, because in the end, you have you know, lots of things you want to show, but you only limited space. So some of the more uh, space demanding installations, specifically closed circuit installations, by Dan Graham, for example, uh, or Vito Kanchi, we were able to include in that um, in that first show half a year earlier. No catalog on that, though. And we referenced that through our catalog later. Um, the second thing was that this was supposed to open in the fall, in November. And then I said, November? That's election day. So I want to open the show in conjunction with the election. And um, to which our director initially said, but nobody's going to come then. They will all only talk about Obama, hopefully about Obama. <laughs> and, um, and I said, no, no, that is perfect. So the, the very first piece of news item that was printed on this one was actually about, um, about uh, Obama, coming from a German news agency. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to Harper. And, um, and then, this is a little bit hard to see, but um, this is why I said we were specifically able to do this because of, what, because of our collection. Um, this is the white panel, one of the white panels by Robert Rauschenberg, which actually uh, made John Cage think that Jesus, if painters can paint nothingness, then musicians and composers should be able to do the same. Which is how he then formulated a little bit later his concept of four minutes, 33 seconds. And um, which is a, um, a, you know, definitely not a fine art piece. Um, it's a score and it's a performance. So we were able to then sort of integrate that in relation to the painting uh, as, as you see, as a piano, 
has a grand piano. Um, it's just, just four tables. Um, and you see a monitor in the back which would um, show performances that Cage had done. Uh, one was recorded by Namjoon Paik in 73, and the other one by uh, a German filmmaker called Henning Lohner on the site of the Berlin Wall, and was actually the last performance Cage uh, ever did in 1990 uh, on, on film. Um, and we exhibited the score, and then as you see here, um, we had a daily performance of the piece in the galleries, which was really crucial to me, but um, it was only one performance a day, and we could have done maybe more, but then again, you know, you need people to do it, and you need volunteers, and this is actually my, one of my best collaborators in the museum, Steve Dye, who is the, the media exhibition manager, and just a genius. <clears throat> so um, he prepared, you know, it's got three movements, and you think this is the easiest thing in the world to perform. It is not. Um, you have to coordinate a number of things. One is three movements that have a very specific time, and then you have to indicate physically that the movement has begun and has ended. And, um, and you also have to read the score so <clears throat> he constructed these um, sand, I don't know how this is called, I mean, when you have sand, just sort of measure time, sand clocks. Hourglasses. Yes, hourglasses, exactly, yes. So he had three hourglasses made specifically for each movement. Um, the notion that we would have live events, not in the museum, but in the galleries, was really something I wanted to explore to a much larger extent than we were in the end able to do it. But um, this was one of the instances where um, it became really seminal. And in the back you see a number of Fluxus related documents. And here is the score, and, um, and then um, another reference that is sort of um, clear that it's, it's about fluxus, but um, it's always a question, how do you not only exhibit documents, but actually make people perform? And um, with George Brecht, we managed to, um, to have his event cards there, coming out of, uh, Fluxus suitcase and Water Yam was an early multiple um, that featured um, his event cards. And George Brecht was important for me because all, almost we had called the show towards participation in art, which then I just, you know, titled my essay. Um, and our publisher said that is too vague. We need a clear title, which is why then, you know, whatever you do in the end, in an institution is a number of um, collaborations and maybe compromises. So it became this very generic title in the end, but for me it was always the direction into which I was going, or we were going. So George Brecht did his first show in 1959 called Towards Events, and that kind of made me think um, much more along those lines of integrating um, events, and we can also talk about spectacle, maybe later, um, into the gallery. One of the things to do that is, um, he has this, it's hard to see here, um, <clears throat> oh, we exhibit this differently, I guess. Um, he has one card that just says exit. And the idea being, once you read that, and you actually do exit the show, then you remember that you now are actually performing the George Brecht piece by exiting the show. We also have his, his three-chair event, uh, which consists of a um, black, a yellow, and a white chair uh, distributed throughout the show. So the moment that you were sitting down, you were performing the George Brecht piece. The second 
section was called Calls to Action. Uh, Brahmo Chula, Lilo Kanchi, Just Boys, Richard Clark, Bali Export, and Yoko Ono. And I'll just show you um, a few images here. Yoko Ono was interesting because we not only showed her historical performance from 65, but also the reenactment of that from 2003. So it was next to each other, and you were able to compare her, her performing it twice in different contexts. And boys, obviously, um, we are the revolution, la revolution siamo noi, um, as a reference to a complex um, legacy that we couldn't possibly include in the show, and we just had one of his speeches to, um, to a television audience. Uh, this is Bobby Export and her expanded cinema idea, tap and touch cinema. And finally, um, one thing I want to focus on a little bit is uh, Lucia Clark, and there was also a precedent for me that was related to LA. Uh, I guess a lot of you have seen the Wax Show that was here about a year and a half or two years ago, and I saw that as well. And I realized that Lucia Clark was in the show with this piece that you see here on the floor, which is called Rede de Elastico, um, Elastic Net. And, um, but the piece was actually hung on the wall and there was no way that you were made to under, understand, to understand that you could actually take this piece and use it and explore it. So that's an experience I've come across in many museums. They actually do show a work that is meant to be activated by the visitor or meant to be participatory in one way or another, but they're exhibiting it in a way that it's, it doesn't happen for obvious reasons. One is that it's just becoming messy. It's becoming uh, more difficult to handle, uh, but it also doesn't quite match their understanding of the gallery space. So, um, so for us, the decision was actually to take it off the wall and just place it on the floor, and we just indicated sort of a section in, in within which people would be um, would be relating to this object, and um, and at the same time, yeah, I guess you can still see it. Uh, we had um, some of her objects as originals, and some of the objects as replicas. So the aspect that you do not only want to reference historical pieces, but you want to actually let people experience the work. This is a crucial, um, crucial part of the concept. Which means that, um, well, this, you know, rubber band, this wouldn't be an original anyway anymore. Um, this is only basically a score, a concept. And uh, and actually, people then were asked also to continue to weave that net of rubber bands. But um, also to, uh, you know, we have two reenactments of Dolly Export. We have an original and replicas, and, um, and we gave some instructions. Now, the whole thing about instructions is, um, is quite interesting, and I was... Um, now, if you haven't seen the Franz West show here at LACMA, I urge you to see that because they have some similar issues. Um, they have pieces which we actually did not include, um, not because it wouldn't have made sense, but just, you know, you can't do everything. So there was no Franz West in the show. And uh, he has this, these pieces called adaptives. And the first thing that you see is they have a whole system of color coding the extent and the location where you are allowed to become active and where you're allowed to touch the artwork. So, you know, as a curator, um, I was very interested in their, their solution to the problem and they made it very clear uh, through colors. We were a little bit more subtle um, and I always told my colleagues who kept reminding me that this we would run into problems there, that um, that this is actually okay. 
that we are inviting a process that is um, that is more ambiguous and that is open to misunderstanding and that we would just embrace that potential of misunderstanding in the show and that this would be a process through which um, not only the curatorial side would go but also the um, you know the visitor services and the guards and everybody involved in the process so here it was actually unclear what to do with the net. And one of my curatorial assistants was completely convinced that this is an object under which you cover someone. And, and Lucia Clark never says that. For her, this is called a relational object. And that just means this is an object with which you can relate to someone else or to a number of people. And it was also very much unclear to what purpose you would need a net, a net of rubber bands. Um, you would basically find out by using it, and it, it bordered on, uh, on a sort of group dynamic psychological situation that had some theoretical effects as well. So they were taking uh, her relational objects out you know, into the countryside and they had their sessions. Um, it was not actually necessarily meant as an object to be exhibited later in a gallery. So that's another set of problems. Um, how much does the work change than taking it from a, um, a much more loosely defined practice, historical practice, into the gallery context into you know almost 40 years later. Um, here you do see one of the things that happened in um, in the galleries, and people were covered. Um, what I do not show you, um, but which is an interesting discussion, is that um, a lot of other things happened as well in the galleries, and um, I found out by things that were posted online. And um, this is something that made me wonder, uh, in a way, to what extent people are actually looking or caring about the work that is being exhibited. And um, in this specific case, they were taking the net and making it into a rope and kind of having this, I would call this, this when you jump rope. Mm -hmm. And um, to an extent, you know, to a moment, to a moment where people would just fall over and trip and kind of fly around the galleries. And we saw this online, and, um, and I actually um, intervened uh, when a colleague of mine wanted to post that video on our official blog. And I said, well, actually, you know, we don't want to invite that kind of video. When that behavior happens, this is something that we, you know, we learn about the work, but I don't want to support that kind of excessive use of a work. And this idea where a work gets used for a different purpose, and how do you define that? And specifically with a work that has no clear instruction anyway, um, that's actually... I thought a very productive moment for me, um, even while, as you stumble across certain problems that this poses to you for the day-to-day -day activity in the galleries. Um, yeah, here's one more shot of that. Here are her goggles, and um, and you know, let me point out, looking at this, that. What we wanted to exhibit was a range of projects that would allow a range of different experiences. Maybe an experience that you would just have alone within a certain situation. An experience that you would have with another person, like this one, or with a group of people. And also maybe an experience where you would come across a barrier that you would not be able to overcome. 
So as much as it was about the openness and the possibility of an opening, it was also always about the limits and the barriers. And, um, and this is particularly an interesting example because let's assume you were just alone uh, going through the show. You needed a partner to do this. And this is honestly a very intimate piece. You are very close to another person. And I heard from many people that this was actually something that they experienced with a complete stranger. You were looking directly, but in a sort of mitigated way, into the eyes of a stranger by doing that. <clears throat> okay, the next section um, is, um, was a little bit loosely defined as instructions for use, and uh, as you can see, we, you know, we were kind of really making big jumps through, through the 70s into the 90s, from Baldessari to Felix Gonzalez Torres, Dan Graham, Tom Marioni, a, a number of um, pieces that related also to our, uh, our collection. And um, this was the one work that whenever I gave a tour of the show, I always said, you know, one day I will give a tour of the show by just using that score. And I never did that. Because basically it would have meant that I would have had to memorize the score, I guess. And, um, however, I looked at this piece as a score and thus as a, um, maybe also as a software, as a piece with which you can produce other works. So it's a painting and um, in the, in, as, as a painting obviously um, a, a finished work of art, but it, it referred you to the idea of text and code and software, which was also the same, um, sorry, um, we had another piece by Dan Graham uh, along those lines, which actually you can see now beautifully um, in the Dan Graham retrospective, um, all his poem schemas. So, important for me was this idea that you, you were taking a discourse from conceptual and performative art uh, to more um, relational aesthetics in the 90s and uh, as, as a parallel trajectory, and I'll come back to that, also through, um, through media art. Um, this is a stack piece by uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres that's from our collection. And um, here, the instruction is very clear that you are invited to take one poster and um, take it home, which is what people did, as you can see here, but at the same time, people also did other things with that, and I'll come back to that. Um, here you see one of the chairs by George Brecht. Um, on, in the far end, you see Eric Worm, and yeah, let me go first to this one here. Um, so, Erin Warm is, um, is kind of the more uh, contemporary version of Franz West, maybe. Um, I just realized here, reading about Franz West adaptives, that this is a, a fridge, and you were supposed to stick your head and your right arm into the fridge. But here, you see someone uh, that, that's actually taken off the internet, um, posted on Flickr, um, someone performing a piece that was completely different. Something else was happening in the galleries. And um, when you saw that space that the artist had asked for, this kind of stage, um, and in the back you had a number of different performances, um, 50 photographs from a practice of about 10 years, um, you realize that people were, were just gathering on this platform and they knew that they had to stay on the platform in order to perform. So that was a very clear way of indicating a space for uh, performativity. 
but they were also, um, as you can see here, they were also just exploring creative uses of being in the gallery. Um, a fourth section was called Utopia Revisited, and this was specifically about technology. Um, and this was also, uh, at least in two cases, or in three cases, um, very specific to California. Ant Farm, Kit Galwich or Rubinovitz, as well as Lynn Hirschman Leeson, are all based um, in, in the Bay Area. And um, Koch produced a project called Common Image, where you were able to upload images to a process, a pro online project that had been going on for almost 10 years, nine years now. And um, that was printed out on the I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, this was a commissioned work, uh, one of the few commissions that we did, and it was called Media Van 0 0.8, and um, it went back to a whole legacy of Ant Farm's practice in the 70s, uh, touring the country, establishing a network of um, producers, and sites for production and discussion of their architectural and media practice. And they had an actual Chevy van uh, until 76, uh, which was then uh, sold, but they had this production van, this studio, and um, they rebuilt this. They, they bought another old historic Chevy completely um, taken apart um, all um, all aspects of the car, so it was just the shell, and then inside you were able to um, what they call the hook up. Um, you were able to hook up uh, your various technological devices and upload images or files to a time capsule. And then, um, this is actually an artist on the show, Warren Sack, uh, then you would get a receipt of your donation. <clears throat> so in the end, we had about 4,000 pictures, and sounds, and text files. And before the show closed, the Ant Farm members had a closing ceremony where a final file was donated, and then the van was sealed, and this became an official time capsule, and uh, it's the, the first time they ever done a digital time capsule, which I thought was interesting. How can you possibly access digital files in 20 years? Um, so that was, I'm, I'm referring to this basically um, because it was a project that revisited the historic practice and reformulated the relevance of that through uh, today's technology. <clears throat> and it produced something. It was a work that started as the show opened and then continued to grow and produce a time capsule. So the idea of production, and I'll go back to that a little bit later, was uh, seminal to the show. And here you had a final giveaway uh, for all those who attended the performance hopefully becoming the collector's item, eventually. Then this was um, Galloway and Robinowitz Hall in Space, and <clears throat> here you have two images. You know, excuse me for sometimes the bad resolution. Uh, this is just, um, I really very quickly grabbed all these images um, in the days um, prior to this, to coming to LA. And this is actually, a, a constructed image uh, that Kit Galloway sent me uh, a few days ago. And the important thing about this was that we, um, we knew that they had video documentation of that, and so far they had exhibited a documentary, uh, an excerpted version, and I asked them if it was possible to go back to the original recordings and um, actually two weeks prior to the opening, we were finally having a digital file that had all six hours, it was a three-day event, 
each day, each evening at, for two hours. So three times two hours make six hours of original recordings from the very first day to the last day. And that, to me, made a crucial difference in the, in the way that you perceive and experience again an artwork. So clearly this was taking something that had happened in public space and bringing it, sort of restaging it in the gallery context. Um, something that was called whole in space because it actually united Los Angeles and New York was now in one space and you were physically part of that and you were looking at basically two historic crowds communicating so it became, in a way, a new piece, but a piece that literally, again, made you experience the kind of excitement and the kind of, um, how shall I put that, the, um, the ways um, in which people actually not only confront an open situation, but begin to develop an approach and a way of using something. And um, Kate Galloway has, has uh, mentioned this a number of times, but um, people started to, you know, this was way before you could Skype. Uh, this was 1980, it was a satellite link. People started to make appointments in front of the, the projections and the cameras. And they phoned their relatives or friends, either in New York or Los Angeles, you know, that they should just meet in front of the screens. So they were not only engaging with whoever was randomly placed opposite um, and sort of establishing a relationship to those strangers, but they were actually using it in an unprecedented and, and unforeseen way. And, um, and this is also the very first time that such a piece that was literally about um, you know, the first satellite projects were only done in the late 70s, 77, 78. And this to me was maybe the most successful ever satellite project from 1980. But the first time that this had become part of an um, art historical survey. Well, can I just ask just sure. one quick question? I don't want to interrupt your flow, but was there any point in which there was a discussion about the possibility of re- remaking or reactivating the piece real time, or was it always about reconstituting the original material? Okay. Um, actually, we never discussed that. Um, partly because I know Kit and Sherry, and I, uh, I knew that this would have, come, would have become a hugely complex undertaking. And um, if you're doing a group show, this is going way beyond your actual needs. This is a project in its own right. And, um, and secondly, uh, so that is just a very pragmatic reason. Secondly, um, I find it more interesting to think about the ways that we are doing this today in different ways. So I, you know, I just mentioned Skype which was actually very important for me um, when I moved to the US and my family was still back in Germany. So I really depended on that kind of communication. And, um, and I was more interested in sort of bringing these two things in one context than in maybe re, um, re-performing, um, performing it. although, um, the one thing that I, you know, I can say up front, the one thing that I was not able to do, uh, running out of time, running out of sheer, uh, you know, lack of, of, of finances as well and resources, um, was a larger outdoor project that would have involved uh, an open public screen, and um, so that's for a future project. But. Um, I think in this specific case, it was more about the reconstruction of, uh, of an historic event. So it's, it's actually, um, I sort of made, um, made a point in saying we are questioning these, these histories 
from Web 2.0 perspectives, but we're not necessarily exhibiting Web 2.0. Uh, we are aware of that context, and we will be using that context in the way that we frame the show. Um, and we did have you know, a few online projects that were kind of part of that discourse, but um, it was literally more about the, um, the review. And um, I realized that these are all so bad in resolution. Um, <clears throat> this was Lynn Hirschman revisiting herself a, a historic performance she did in 1973 called The Dante Hotel um, in Second Life. And that was also partly a commissioned process, a project. Um, and Second Life, by the way, was the, the one project my son just loved. Mm -hmm. And for all the wrong reasons, it was all about just making these figures jump up and down. Um, a fifth section was called Testing Authority. Uh, Franz Dalis, Minerva Cuevas, Maria Eichhorn, and Angeli Montadas. And that was basically the idea, um, specifically relevant maybe for this project by Francis Dalis called Reenactments, um, where an artist, this is actually not about you participating, but about uh, it's a video installation, a two-channel video installation, in which he walked the streets of Mexico City with a gun in his hand. We see him in the beginning buying the gun in the shop and then walking out, and uh, eventually he's stopped by the police after about 10 or 11 minutes. And um, so seeing that, a person walking the streets with a gun in his hand is... Uh, I would not want to imagine this for Los Angeles, what would happen here. This is potentially such a, a risk for the artist, for the performer, um, that I was completely amazed that he convinced the authorities to do it again, to reenact this concept. So you see these two versions side by side, and I was, I included that as a way to also point to the difference between an artist and the public. The role that the artist has, the role that the public has, and in this specific case also the, uh, the impact and the risk that is involved in performing. And uh, what is maybe a more um, entertaining way of, sort of risking yourself just being ridiculized by performing in every room here had a much more deeper and um, sort of consequential uh, impact. And um, in a more conceptual way, Maria Eichhorn did the same by testing Japanese authorities and sending a uh, Robert Metalthorpe catalog to a show she wanted to do, which was then um, censored by a Authorities, Japanese customs authorities. So that was that was actually physically at the core of the show, a kind of uh, more um, more more of a critique of the conditions of participation, and um, a sixth section called public dialogue involved um, a lot more media-based works that were either just um, making you perform again with the here, um, a piece by Matthias Gommel, uh, two microphones that were linked and had a, uh, sorry, headphones that had a microphone and you were talking to each other, so nothing spectacular or new, but there was a slight delay um, and you experienced the miscommunication that is just added to a process by slightly <coughs> shifting one of the uh, conditioning factors. And um, here, that was a, a very, sorry, that is the wrong title there. That's a mistake. Uh, this is by Rafael Lozano Hemmer, Microphones from 2008, in which, um, you know, the microphone is clearly a very strong visual uh, tool to, to 
let you perform in public. In this case, it not only re uh, played back your voice, it also recorded your voice. And um, it recorded not only your voice and played back your voice, but also the voice of others. So it, it was a playback and recording device at the same time, and it built up a database of voices and, uh, and, and set sentences that people had left in the show. So in the beginning, literally, there was no content for this piece. And finally, a seventh section that was spread throughout the museum. Um, here, I um, may come back to this um, MJA, and you were voting about a performance that was performed at the end of the show, and you were voting on all aspects of that performance. And Tom Marioni's um, Free Beer Salon, I'll come back to that, that was the most successful part of the show, I can say, um, as you can see here. But I wanted to, um, to mention this before talking about some specific works, because we were faced with this, um, with this task that obviously you want to revisit your practice, you want to revisit your relationship to the public, but also the public's relationship to you. That was kind of the, the, the overall frame. But then you also need to address specific spaces that you're working in. And the gallery space is very clearly defined. And one way of addressing that was to include a much more um, live component uh, into the galleries. But also, it worked the other way around. An educational space like this one um, had to be activated in a different way. And in order to do that, it's a little bit like this space here, which is so, excuse me, unattractive. <laughs> but um, it doesn't quite invite you know, your presence here. Um, you are here because there are seats and there's a lecture, so it has certain functionalities. And we wanted to have a space that, um, that was undefined. And it was very difficult to do because that specific educational space is heavily designed through the furniture, but also through you know the, just the way the whole space is architecturally uh, formulated and, and framed. So um, we asked a New York-based architectural uh, group <coughs> called Free Cell to develop the furniture for that space so that we would be able to have a much more hybrid idea of a space that could involve a lecture, that could involve a free beer salon, that could involve a committee meeting, um, an educational workshop, etc., etc., a screening, and so on. And, um, and that was maybe one of the biggest failures in this show, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So let me get back to this, the beginning of the show. <clears throat> Hans Hake News, like Horn and Space, is maybe one of the projects that's dearest to my understanding of art. And um, I, that's a piece I had never seen. It, it had never been exhibited for a long time. And then he had a retrospective in Germany in 2006. Unfortunately, it was divided into two cities, Berlin and Hamburg, and I was only able to go to Berlin, and as it happened, this piece was in Hamburg, so I didn't see it. Uh, and it had only been shown in the US after the initial presentation, actually from 1970 in New York, uh, in 2005 in a gallery. So this, is, by all means, this is a historic work, and you actually see here the um, his very first interpretation and presentation in 1969 in Düsseldorf as part of a show called uh, Prospect. And it was linked to a news agency in Germany, and it was printing the news. That's the piece. It's just printing the news. Very simple. 
So at the time, in 1969, this was a state of the art. This had never been done before, that an artist would actually take content that was not even accessible to people not working in the news agencies or in, in journals or in newspapers. Um, so you were getting raw, undigested material into the gallery. So there was <coughs> this idea of circumventing censorship, but also this idea that here is coming into the gallery space what you could say is the framework and the reference in which we work, in which we live, in which we act. So it's the political context that is all of a sudden manifested in the galleries. And, um, and then, you know, you've seen this before, we, um, with, you know, in, in, in conversation, obviously, with Hans Haken, we, um, we re, um, restaged this, and um, his instruction was very simple. He said, just a simple table, and um, it has to be, you know, a dot matrix printer, which is not so easy to get anymore. Um, but there is a crucial difference. This is not 1969 anymore, this is 2008. And there's not one source of information, but there is actually a range of sources. And the sources is not coming off a phone cable, but off the internet. So there was an RSS feed, and the news sources ranged from, obviously, the New York Times or CNN, to uh, BBC, to uh, Deutsche Welle, to uh, also Al Jazeera, and uh, China Daily, and, um, uh, and Pravda, and so a number of global sources. That was important for me. And not one political trajectory. That was another important aspect for me. So for me, placing that in front of the opening was kind of a gesture to say, this is actually making clear that we're working in a specific context, but also that this context has changed over time. And this is now a historic piece, but revisited through um, the technology of 2008. And then um, what, what was really beautiful, it became this heap of paper and um, it, we were able to let it grow over three months. So in the end, it almost blocked the whole entrance to the show. And, and people were, were free to just pick up the news and to read. So it was something that you could touch. But, um, and some people did. But obviously, like here, <laughs> not everybody was interested in news. <laughs> Um, I'm showing you this picture, um, so sort of compare it with this one or that one. Um, this I found on Flickr, and um, I was very struck by the way that um, this visitor had interpreted this as a photography, um, making it really look massive and uh, something that our professional photographer had not managed to do at all. <laughs> so um, I, really, I must really say this is one of the key insights for me. Uh, so many more pictures um, that other people have taken told me about the things that we did than what we were able to document. We, you know, what can you expect from a museum photographer? A very clean, a neutral and boring documentation. <laughs> um, however, what I liked about this piece as well was that you could look at it in two ways. One was as a sculpture and a, as a material object, but then there was also the real-time effect. And although, you know, I mean, I turned this off now, but to, I mean, ideally, you know, you, you could be online anywhere you are, any time. Uh, we, most of us have these devices today. So what's the point in sort of reading the news that come in when you can have this any time you want? 
The point is that you can, but you don't. And also, you do not necessarily get these news, because these are unfiltered. And these are news that you wouldn't read typically when, no. Like, I go to the New York Times online, and I have like my five, six links I always go to. I do not go to the economic section necessarily, or to whatever section. So there are some sort of inbuilt filters, and here people were really reading the real time effect. That was the important part. Microsoft and TV in talks. <laughs> Does that suggest something about the power of, of information materialized somehow? Yes, well, obviously, you know, you could make a pun and say, you see yesterday's news. It's, it's just this heap of information that's being processed and produced and then discarded. Um, but I, what, what I really liked was the fact that it, it made you aware of all those people who contribute to our reading of the world, of politics and economics. So there are all these participants that do not even know that they're participating in this piece, uh, contributing content to the show. But then it's also you literally browsing physically in sort of a very old, literal and traditional way um, this, um, this heap of discarded news, possibly finding something that, that you have, have never, you know, hadn't been aware of. And, um, and then thirdly, you know, you were, you were made aware of something that was happening right now. Like, you know, profits that vanished. Was there any kind of, was there any kind of, like, permission you had to go through? <coughs> uh, well, yeah, I don't want to go too much into technical details of staging such a show, but we had a clear instruction, you know, you're welcome to pick up the paper and read. Uh, and browse, um, and we had to add a, here, um, right in front of the printer, we had to add, after a while, a note saying, please do not touch the printer, because people kept pushing buttons. I mean, actually, permission from like, the organizations like the news is coming from, the news media. The organization? Yeah. Yeah. No, she was saying, she was asking, um, did, did the museum need to ask permission from Reuters, let's no. say? Oh. No, no, no. This is public information. It's available. It, it's online. It's RSS feeds. So Anybody how can is this. something that you wouldn't normally come across? Then? Sorry? How is that news something you wouldn't normally come across? Then? The news coming, being fed in that print. How that works? No, how is it unfiltered? How is it different than how we would normally experience It's not different. Yeah. Um, it is out there. You just you would just have to go to these sites and uh, and sort of subscribe to to their news sources. So it's it, you know, that, that's what I'm saying. It's it's actually. Well, you're uh, saying filter. It sounds like you're saying uncensored. Like it's not. No, it's okay. It's unfiltered in the sense that um, it doesn't necessarily get reflected in and then what comes into the papers and what comes into the news sources that get broadcast. Um, it, is, um, it is just what news agencies produce. The, the word would be edited. Yes, so, so by editors, yeah. exactly. Um, but then let me talk about something maybe um, more challenging in terms of staging this. This is um, titled Three German Artists Who Had Done This Project Only Once Before in 2001 in a Gallery Space, kind of an alternative space. The first public white cube, and as we all know, the white cube is something we all fight against, um, and the idea that the white cube is defined by the institution and by the art system, as well as by the curators, is something very well known. So 
these artists who have a record in sort of net activism or net art in the 90s uh, turn to, to eBay, to be eBay as a filter to determine who gets exhibited. And the way it was staged was that they collaborated with two Californian uh, artists. What you're looking at here is a group here from LA called Ten Pound Ape, Gustavo Herrera and Matt Wardell. And um, they came up with this shack of just materials that, that were randomly found and produced this very, very physical structure. And you could, uh, right here, that's Gustavo, you could enter the shack and there was, there was music inside and, um, um, and it looked kind of messy and people basically just left things, um, they took things. It was absolutely uncontrolled. However, there was a webcam as well. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to have two different sets onto which people could act. And uh, the way that you could act upon this setting was by winning the auction on eBay. So each week there was an auction that uh, gave you the right to make an intervention into this piece. So I thought that was interesting. Um, it kind of questioned a number of issues. Um, one of them being um, who pays basically gets into a small one. I mean, to put it a little bit broadly. Um, but why would you want to do that? And what do you do? So that was an open question. And we just, we just curatorially speaking, we just had agreed upon two sets, two rounds. And I'll show you the second round a little bit in a moment. So this was uh, number one. And um, after, um, yes, okay, after um, a week, um, we had one artist who had paid about $200, and it was a local artist, and he thought he could just take the whole thing apart and open it to the public to perform inside that sort of destroyed or deconstructed uh, structure. And then he found out that he just had one day to do it, the day actually the museum was closed on Wednesday, and he couldn't physically do it. So he revisited his concept and then he just uh, displaced items and documented those displacements uh, with photographs on the wall. And the next day when the public came in, he invited the public to do the same and added those uh, documents um, to the space. It was a kind of very minimal intervention, didn't have a big impact. The second winner was actually a German artist I had never heard of. And she sent a computer-generated film uh, via our FTP server and just asked that we exhibit that film uh, on this computer screen. Um, and I believe I have a second <clears throat> picture, yes. That was more or less how it looked. Um, it was actually darker. We took the lights down and the, the whole shack was not lit anymore except from the inside. So the focus would be more on that film. Still, that was relatively conventional, I thought. But then the third winner uh, was a, a, um, an artist from uh, Oakland. And um, she then was completely organized. And she brought a team of five people, and within a day, they had this whole structure wrapped in this kind of elastic fabric. And they had left the lights inside intact so it would kind of glow from the inside. And it, it achieved something that you thought was almost impossible to achieve. Something that looks so messy and that is so massive that kind of really challenges your capabilities of changing anything at all, um, became this almost crystal-like um, aestheticized object for one week. 
and really transformed the space quite a bit. And I'm saying this um, in order to point to one preconceived idea about participation, that this typically involves a great idea and a sort of very democratic process, but it does not necessarily produce an interesting aesthetic result. And one of the things that this project did was to actually convince you of the contrary. It can produce something very interesting also aesthetically. And, um, and then again, you could say, whichever way, it doesn't matter because the, the piece actually is about the way that this changes through the intervention by the public. There's another shot of the gallery and this was the website that's actually still up. You can go to publicwhitecube.com and you can see the whole documentation of that. And um, <clears throat> we are um, about how much, I'm just trying to time a break. How okay. Much, about how much um, more? You know, I'll just go as, as much as I can and then you stop me. <laughs> Okay, let me go. All right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just go briefly through this. And yep. then, um, so the second one was just a very minimal sculpture. It was a sand sculpture by Lydia Carroll from San Francisco. And this was an intervention that did not exist in the real space, but only as a digital image online. And the artist in Berlin had no idea that this was actually not in the space. Then another one artist, another artist made this a more theatrical installation. The third destroyed that installation. And the fourth just sent a related poster to be exhibited as the final comment. That's how it looked. So people walking in the, into the gallery didn't quite know what was going on. They had to read the concept that was online and that was um, exhibited outside that space. So, okay. Um, here is Gonzalez Torres turned into something completely else. Um, and here is the kind of activity that happened um, on the Every Room platform. And I've had, we've had this before. This was really for us sort of testing the limits of the institution. When do you actually intervene? How open can you, can you be for processes to happen? And here is, as a, as a maybe more humorous final note on this, the instruction for the fridge actually read, put your head and arm in the fridge and have a line and smoke, or smoke a joint, or drink a beer. So guess what happened? This being San Francisco, somebody smoked a joint in the fridge. I would never imagine this to actually happen. All right. So this points to something that is maybe more about the failures um, and the, um, the processes that however evolved despite a concept. And um, I mentioned before, free cell producing uh, something to transform the educational space. And they had four structures that uh, the whole concept was called stack to fold. Uh, initially it was stacked a lot as a two dimensional uh, piece on the wall. And we had a table, we had a structure that they called elbow and we had a bench that actually, there were two components to the bench, so we had three objects, but four pieces of cardboard. And you were asked to basically just fold it into an object. And uh, as it turns out, um, here you see someone folding it, the instruction was printed onto the piece, and here you saw some results, but um, I can tell you, people were completely puzzled by it. And this is actually my class at the Art Institute. 
and we are setting up a classroom here. Um, the thing was that it was impossible to understand the instructions, and uh, it was only um, and if you didn't do it exactly the way it was supposed to be, you produced something that was weak in structure, and you would just like fall to the floor. So it did not work from a functional point of view. And, um, and I kept saying to everybody, that's okay. <laughs> I don't mind if it's not a museum uh, as a moment. It became an installation. And, um, and once a week we have this salon, that, that's Tom. And part of it was a performance. And we had about 14 cases of beer. And when that was gone, Salon was over, and um, and that you can't really see from these pictures, but that became a hugely popular event. <laughs> However, um, we've also had you know Rikri Turbanija, for example, do cook in in the museum for a select number of guests, and um, and we I've, I've come across a number of works that kind of implicitly make that reference to something that you could do in a space, but then that has never happened or would not happen for whatever reasons. I was very keen on exhibiting works that would, that would actually involve a social situation and explore a social situation and develop that. So in this case, um, this was, these were two hours. Um, you know, I was the first bartender. Below, you see our director being the second bartender, and then there were a number of performers. Here is another colleague. Um, so each time there was a performance part of that salon, and it turned a um, a functional space into temporarily into something completely different, and it made us certainly me, but I guess the whole museum as well as our visitors aware of how much sociability uh, our museum was lacking. And um, it produced a, um, a sort of communal spirit that, that just came out of the gesture of giving out a free beer. And obviously, you know, it needed some funds for that. It was actually not sponsored, which we had hoped for. Last project, The Gift, San Francisco. This was, uh, for me, maybe the most, um, apart from Hans Hake, maybe the most important project. Um, Jochen Geertz is a, um, born in Germany, but had lived in Paris and France for 40 years, and now moved to Ireland. Um, a conceptual artist, a performer, a, uh, an installation artist, a media artist, but since the mid-90s, he's exclusively working on um, public space, in public space and on the notion of public space. And um, he did this once in Germany in 2000, and the idea of this <coughs> project called The Gift was that you would exhibit a photo studio in the museum and you had your picture taken, you can see that in the back. Um, show you another picture of that. You had your picture taken, and like here, and it would be um, taken on the condition that you give your portrait, but you would also receive a portrait in return at the end of the show. The portrait would then be processed, printed, and framed. <clears throat> and finally, in this huge storage facility, you would be stored all on the same floor and exhibited temporarily. And we had a kind of rotation of photographs that were representing the community of the Bay Area, but also people who just happened to uh, visit or you know, even tourists. Uh, come to the of MoMA. That, in the end, became <clears throat> um, a community of 
almost 2,000 people who have given their portrait. Um, something again that was not really um, clear in the beginning was the way that it was also perceived as something um, aesthetic, something that really engaged you on a visual level and not just on a conceptual level or on a sort of political level, but that actually was about the idea of a portrait and about an exchange with another person. And that was really due to um, the way that all those 40 volunteers who contributed as photographers and printers and so on to this, how they were engaging with their, um, with their models. So um, here you see a number of portraits. They had all the same idea of framing, but the important thing was it was an open gaze into the camera. And then what happens, this is again taken off flicker. Jochen Geert says, this is a museum visit, is about meeting yourself. You look for yourself when you come to the museum. And when you are mad at contemporary art, it's because you do not find yourself in that. <clears throat> and so this was very literally taking, finding yourself again. So people came back in order to see if they were exhibited and took those pictures and posted them or took pictures off the database, which I thought was kind of strange. <clears throat> that was the very last day, uh, February 8th. And we took all pictures down, and we took them to the, the atrium, and we uh, displayed them in, uh, in a sort of conference uh, space that we have. And um, the artists came back, and more than 700 people physically came back on the very last day to claim their portrait. And um, when they came, here's the artist, in person, uh, shook hands with everybody. There was a random selection. You would just get whatever was coming up as the portrait you, that you would get. And um, a lot of people knew, but not everybody knew. We kind of left it a little bit open. A lot of people thought that they would get their portrait, their own portrait, and to which, to whom he said, well, you don't need me to have your own portrait. You can just go to a photographer. So this is, this is really about the interaction and the meeting of another. And um, here you see a number of um, uh, people who show their pictures. I can also show you, this is actually my wife, the portrait she got. And uh, this is a portrait I got. So I also stood in line and received a randomly selected portrait. And this is then how we exhibited that at home next to each other. So the condition was you get a portrait in return, but you have to exhibit that at home or in your office. And for him, that was, on a more conceptual level, the idea that the museum is not the site of collecting, of uh, exhibiting the finished artwork. He turns it around. The museum is the site of production. And the museum is then also the site that redistributes the work. So now we have a number of about 100 framed portraits left as a kind of representation of that process in our collection. But more, you know, more than 800 were physically given out. So a lot of couriers were actually acting for friends, taking two or three. Um, so the idea of a work that is on public loan to the public, to its producers. And, um, and if you go on Flickr, and you look for, as of MoMA, participation. You see lots of people who, um, who documented all kinds of works. Um, there was actually a photographer on the street who saw all these people 
coming out of the museum with a picture. <laughs> and as a curator, I thought that was the, you know, one of the best moments of that show, really, that people take pictures out of the museum. And, uh, and so he got interested in this, in, you know, what was happening there, and, and photographed that. <laughs> and that was, somebody got me. <laughs> and um, so I was actually able to meet that person who got my portrait. And, um, and we exchanged hearts. So, um, and then later on he sent me that, uh, you know, that kind of documentation. So, um, I have a lot more to say about this. But uh, maybe as as a way to open up the discussion is that um, you know this is an idea that that was now once shown in in our museum in a specific setting, which is San Francisco in 2008. And obviously, San Francisco has this close proximity to Silicon Valley and kind of this idea of a technological utopia much more than many other places. And this show is now going to travel to Dortmund, a, an industrial city in Germany, uh, which has a, a fantastic museum called Museum am Ostwald, which uh, has a collection that is pretty much based on, uh, on fluxes and, um, and, and sort of the legacy of Joseph Boyce. And they're going to open a new museum in um, 2010 with this show, and you have to um, you have to know that I guess a little bit like Pittsburgh or maybe some other uh, parts of, of this country, Baltimore maybe, uh, there are parts um, of sort of a country or there are urban centers uh, whose identity is really based on, on industrialization and something that has you know, is is sort of becoming historic. Um, and they have to reinvent themselves. And in Germany, in the rural beat, that has happened over the last 10, 15 years. A kind of music, museumification of industrial sites happened there. Uh, however, um, this show is going now to that kind of industrial center. So it will really become a, um, a focal point of a, a totally different context in relation to San Francisco. And that's, that's an interesting thing for me to sort of re, um, reinvent this show, to update the show, but also to establish different connections to different geography. And that's um, something that um, I should show you this physically, that we were not yet able to do. If you see the catalog, there is uh, this open frame um, that is actually supposed to host a second publication which would document the processes that this show has generated. And, um, for, and this is meant to be the print-on-demand that you would just, just order online with a range of different options of either aesthetic options or maybe also content, so different choices that you could make. Um, so it would become your personalized copy by whatever you place in the center of that. Um, that was the idea, um, but then um, at the end of 2008, it became clear that we had to cut some costs, and cut some funds, and so it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I was very intrigued by, and I, th I think I showed you a few pictures where I thought the way that the public documents what the museum is doing is actually a lot more interesting than our perspective from the inside, because that is so so much dominated by an institutional uh, functionality um, that the uses that people have made of these pieces told me a lot about what we actually did, and told me also a lot about um, how we need to change the institution in the future. One very simple thing that we did because of the show, we changed our photography policy. Previously, it was forbidden to take pictures. Still, if you look around in one museum, it's okay, in another museum, it's still forbidden. And I was able to convince everybody by saying, listen, 
It doesn't matter whether we allow it or forbid it. People are doing it anyway. And it's only taking into account what is happening. And that was also part of my whole argument for the show that I said, you know, it's, if we're a museum of modern art who also, which also thinks of it itself as, as a, a site uh, of reflection on contemporary art, then we actually have to follow what artists are doing and what the public is doing. Not in the sense that we have to do the same thing, but we have to follow a kind of development in a critical way and maybe in our own way, but we have to reflect upon this. And, uh, and I know it's a lot more work, it's actually a lot of work, doing that over a month, over three months, um, to sustain that, that level of activity for so long. But it, um, it actually provides to many people a point of entry to the museum that they did not have before. And um, at that point of entry was sometimes to deliberately <coughs> test our limits, smoke a joint, or you know, do whatever you wanted to do to sort of show your creativity. Um, but in some ways also to rethink the museum as a, mo a lot more public space. And, um, you know, coming from Germany, they, the, the idea that the museum belongs to the public is obviously much more uh, felt and much more inscribed in the, in the, in the policies and the politics uh, as as is the case in the U.S., where in the end, you know, it's a private institution. Um, <clears throat> so, that idea that you can convince a private institution that it has a public role, and that it has to have a role in relation to mm -hmm. the sort of civic responsibility, was something that we were able, through the show, which was also then part of a larger museum-wide initiative, to sort of inscribe into our agenda for you know the next ten years that this is something that we need to think and take into account, and think of and take into account, and um, which is not saying that uh, now we'll do you know more of these shows like next like next year or in two years. No, it, it's you know it's a, it's a slower process. There's going to be that next monographic show like always. Uh, again, it's not it's not changing the institution sort of at the base, but um, I think um, the extent to which we were able to um, to challenge um, notions that participation is is a great concept but does not work for a collecting institution. I think that was um, maybe one of the major successes of that show. Um, yeah. Uh, talking I, I, I'm going to propose, yeah, I, I think that I, I, know, I hope this doesn't seem too selfish or even sadistic, but um, I propose that we not take a break as we usually do. If that's okay with you, or not, sure. we should continue with questions from our students and discussion broadly. That's okay with you? Sure. Sure. Because I think we need, we would want to take as much of your time as because we only have basically around 45 minutes left. Today, I know. Right? So okay. Well, I told you you were no. suffering from the fact that this is the first time I. <laughs> but let me uh, bring a chair so you can sit down. Yeah, I should have read. I. I I'll use this as some of those for the discussion. I think we should uh, 